Hi, welcome everybody. I'm just going to give it another minute or two as everybody's joining. If you'll just take a minute and put your contact information into the chat, that again just helps us get to know who everybody is on the call. Hub members, if you will put an asterisk in front of your name so that we will know who to assign to breakout rooms. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started again as you're joining. If you'll put your name and contact information into the chat, it just is a way for us to know who's on the call for all of us to get to know each other. Um, if you noticed at the very beginning, it does show that this echo session is being recorded. We store those on our Canvas pages. Um, that you can go back and review those at any point in time as well to just um, continue to improve our quality for these echo sessions. If you've never joined an echo session, um, welcome. They are a great way to learn content information as well as um, professional networking. So we do encourage you to be interactive, raise your hand, put questions into the chat. And the other great way is with a case narrative. Um, we oftentimes work with families and clients and uh, situations that are tough and we don't always have the right answers, but there's amazing people on this call that provide um, information to us. So we do always have a case presentation. The case presentation does not need to match the topic that we are talking about. It's really just that way to um, learn from each other and get some resources for some of those uh, clients and families that we work with. So if you're interested in doing a case narrative, please reach out to us and we'd love to have you. As always, because we are talking about um, individual information, please de-identify that. Uh, don't use any identifiable information. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to a hub member. They have that asterisk in front of their name, so they are easy to find on the call. Key components of an echo session is we will always have a didactic speaker, and then we do a case presentation and feedback, really building up that professional networking and community practice knowledge sharing. So please participate in those. Um, and like I said, they're a great way to know who to reach out to when you have a tough case about different things. We've all been on Zoom for a while, so should know how to rename our profile and how to raise our hand. Um, but if you wanna put your discipline or where you are from, Again, it's just a way that we can know who's on the call and know when to reach out to different people. Um, Pre-registration is uh, done through our Zoom, and you can also email us at timetoact at aggies.usu.edu. We will mail out a uh, credit for attendance after the survey has been completed. Um, so we will be dropping in the survey link throughout today's session, um, as well as a follow-up email. So please uh, fill out those surveys. It's a way that we can ensure that we keep these sessions free and no cost to everybody. Canvas is where we store all of our information. So any PowerPoints, the case recommendation lists, um, the session recording. So if you want access to our Canvas page, you can email us at timetoact at aggies.usu.edu. We also will, everybody who's in attendance will get a invite to the Canvas page. Another plug for case studies, they are that great way to get valuable information for cases that you're working on. Um, and it's also a great way to celebrate some of your cases. So if you please, if you have an interest in doing that, please reach out to any of us at time to act at aggies.usu.edu. We have our social media pages where we provide um, upcoming events, different types of resources that our amazing hub team shares with us. 
um, as well as any of our other echoes that we hold here at the Institute. So if you've not followed us, take a minute to follow us. I'm really thrilled today to introduce um, Tyrell and Jet. Um, they are going to be talking to us about information on the LGBTQ community. Tyrell, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I am very excited to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Tyrell Wild. Um, I am a student at Utah State University right now in the uh, Master of Social Work program. And I also am today representing Flourish, uh, Flourish Therapy, which is a nonprofit organization based out of Orm, Utah, that um, provides mental health services for LGBTQ plus uh, individuals and their families. Um, Jet? Hi, my name is Jet or Jaylee. I go by either. Um, and I know Tyrell from our program. We're in school together currently. And I um, am working at a private practice here in Logan, Utah with uh, supervisor Heather Olson. And I specialize in working with LGBTQ plus mental health. Um, so that's, yeah, a little bit about me and how we know each other. So our presentation today, um, as you can see, is going to be on LGBTQ plus health. Um, specifically, we want this to be an opportunity um, to explore the LGBTQ plus experience kind of as an introduction. We do want to focus uh, promotion on understanding, knowledge, but then also since we are uh, collectively representing providers um, that um, offer community health and resources, we do want to explore specific topics such as physical safety and mental well-being for this population. Um, throughout the presentation, you may hear Jet and I interchangeably use LGBTQ plus and queer as uh, to, to refer to this population. We'll talk about terminology a little bit more, but I want to uh, mention that up front just to avoid any confusion. Um, we do hope that this is a relatively interactive presentation um, with everyone. Um, we'll invite you at times to share thoughts either in the chat um, or we are happy to invite you to speak if you're in a space where you can unmute um, both your uh, microphone and your video. We love to participate um, as best as possible. Um, with that being said, you'll notice that throughout our presentation, there's there's going to be a lot of text on our slides. We don't expect you to read everything. We're not going to be reading everything. One of the most common questions we get as presenters is, are we going to get these slides afterwards? And the answer is yes. So don't, don't feel like you need to read everything, write it down. We included a lot of text so that when you're re referring back to this in the future, you'll have some of that information available to you. Um, yeah. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, uh, we recognize that a check-in was already kind of done by at the beginning of this by the people hosting us today. Um, so this doesn't necessarily need to be done again, but we really do want to get to know you guys and um, any questions you may have. So we're really hoping for the, the interactive piece as much as possible for y'all. So if you have questions or something comes up, like put that in the chat so that we can talk about it um, and address any questions you may have um, during all of this. Um, is there anything you'd like to add here, Tyrell? Um, I'm just pulling up the chat to kind of familiarize for myself. Let's see. Looks like we've got some physical therapists, um, some LCSWs, um, developmental specialists, parent support specialists. So I'm just really wanting to get a feel for, for where folks are coming from today so that what we discuss ends up being pertinent to the work you do. So feel free to share out if you haven't already in, in the chat, just these three items, your name, your institution, and your area of practice so that we can refer back to that and, and make sure that 
we're making this applicable. So. Perfect. So the next thing we'll go over is our presentation outline. Um, so this just gives kind of a roadmap for what we're going to cover today. Um, so we'll start with an overview of identities, um, history, those we'll spend relatively short amount of time on. And then we really want to focus in on this lifespan, common experiences you may see at certain age ranges, and then risk and protective factors for those individuals' mental health um, in the community. Um, and then we have some continuing discussion. And then I we also additionally provided quite a bit of resources um, for you all to look at at the end um, and to continue some of this research or helps answer some questions that you may have that we didn't necessarily have time to cover today. Um, so that is our plan for this. Um, anything else here, Tyrell? Um, I don't think so. Not, not really. Before we go into the, uh, no, this is fine. You can you can leave it right there. Okay, um, I'm gonna actually switch to gallery view so that I can see those who have cameras on and stuff. I'm not looking at my presentation right now. Um, I am curious. We have we have this whole presentation planned, and this is something that Jet and I discussed. We are happy to throw this away and let you guys look at it later on if that's what you want to look look at eventually and just do a q and a session if that would be more beneficial for people if you have a burning question about the queer community about how your work with them is important or if it's important um situations that you've come across in your practice and you're not sure how to navigate things related to to this community that you just simply don't understand. We are happy to, to open this up to be a Q&A forum, if that's of interest to people. So I'm putting you all on the spot right now. I'm, I'm quite aware of that. <laughs> what, I, what I'm going to do to give you a second to kind of maybe consider that is I'm going to invite everyone to maybe share in the chat or if you feel comfortable sharing vocally. Um, one goal that you hope to accomplish by the end of this presentation. What is something you hope to learn? A question you hope to have answered? Give you all brief moments to consider that and to share. Tyrell, since I am sharing my screen, I'm not going to open up the chat because I will just put like a black box on the screen, I think. So any <laughs> questions in the chat, can you relay them to me? Yes, I'm, I'm watching you. as they're starting to come in. So um, learning to be sensitive and appropriate when working with families and young children. Um, that's one goal that we've got here. I'm also kind of just reviewing some of those, uh, the different organizations that we've got represented. Okay, so we've got, um, one thing that uh, folks are wanting to learn is how experiences may change and differ depending on the stages of development, uh, understanding correct language and terminology. Ooh, you guys can give little hearts in the chat. I didn't know that. Well, I'm going to invite you to continue to share out in the chat, um, learning how not to be unintentionally disrespectful or learning how uh, not wanting to create an unsafe space for parents and child. I really appreciate that. The intersectionality between uh, disability and queer identities, okay? So thank far, you. everything that I'm hearing, yeah, thank you for your input, but um, not but. And I feel like a lot of what you're saying in the chat will be covered during what we've kind of prepared to talk about. And so feel free if we touch on something that you put in the chat and you want us to talk a little bit more, or spend maybe a little bit more time there, feel free to let us know and we can do that. Okay, um, are you ready to go to the next slide, Tyrell? Absolutely. Perfect. Um, 
So we're going to just an overview of some common language um, that may be used during this presentation that you may run into uh, while working with people in this community. Um, the first thing that I wanted to point out here is the most respectful way um, and the baseline is just use the language of the person. If they tell you your, their identity, their pronouns, what they um, what's important to them that you know about their identity, just use that language back in a respectful way. Um, will be kind of just like the baseline for this because um, we're not gonna be able to cover every single possible identity and all of that. Um, so just use the language that you come across when working with somebody. Um, a couple other terms here is gender diverse. It's an umbrella term to describe um, diversity in gender as the name suggests. Um, and under this large umbrella term, you'll run into things like transgender would fall under this more umbrella term. Um, Gender queer. there's a lot of other terms that can fall under that. And then we wanted to point out that there's a difference in between gender identity and sexual orientation. They are two separate pieces of identity that fall under the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and gender identity is one's internal sense of who they are. Um, and then sexual orientation relates to someone who's uh, related to who a person is attracted to. So for an example, a transgender individual can identify as straight. Um, so once again, that just kind of comes back to use the language of the person and the identity that they talk to you about. Um, and then a couple other terms that you might come across relating to gender are AFAB and AMAB, and they stand for assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth. We'll occasionally use those terms. Um, in the presentation, uh, does anybody have any questions relating to this or maybe a term that they are unsure about that we can discuss? Um, are there any questions in the chat, Tyrell? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Sometimes trying to understand all of this language is like, I, I don't really get how these all interact with one another and what we're actually talking about. And so the, the Trans Student Educational Resource Institute created a graphic this was created by a, a trans student. Um, it's called the Gender Unicorn. You may have seen the Gender Genderbread Man as well as another one that I'm familiar with that helps us try and, I guess, ex express gender identity and attraction and, and these things in a more, I guess, concrete way. It tries to help us wrap our minds around it. So gender identity, you can see our unicorn friend here. Um, they've got this little thought bubble. This refers to them, the, the intrinsic part of who they are. Um, their identity is who they feel they are when they wake up, when they go out. I am this much man, this much woman, this much of other genders, right? This is who they are, just as other parts of your identity is, is a way to describe who you are. Now, gender expression, on the other hand, if if I am a closeted trans woman, I know that, that I'm a woman. However, because it's unsafe for me at work to present feminine, I may dress very masculine and presenting as, as a boy. All right. Gender expression in, is a way for us to see extrinsically uh, gender representation. Now, the example that I gave of, of a trans woman feeling unsafe, that's, that's not our goal here. We want somebody's gender expression to be authentic and valid. Um, and it, it may be fluid from times as well. Um, now, these gender identities and expressions, you'll notice the, the gender identity is the, the little thought bubble. The gender expression kind of shows the person as a whole. Well, when we talk about the sex that was assigned at birth, going back to those terms, AFAB and AMAB, assigned female at birth, assigned, which one did I say? Assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth. That refers primarily to somebody's genitalia and um, DNA and the way that our 
medical system right now operates. We we see if somebody has a penis, they're a boy. If somebody has a vagina, they are a girl. And that's that's sex assigned at birth. Um, the thing is, you may notice this little purple icon here that says other and intersex. Um, our, our DNA is not always XX and XY. There are lots of variations that occur naturally um, that we would refer to as intersex. And, and these individuals um, may be born with ambiguous genitalia. And uh, in the past, people would um, make the decision for the child to perform surgeries or other med medical interventions to um, assign them a birth, uh, a gender at that birth, essentially. Okay. So that's, that's kind of a, a way for us to distinguish between gender and sex assigned at birth. And then when we look at the gender unicorn's heart, that's where we kind of get into sexuality and who somebody is physically and emotionally attracted to. And that's, that's where the sexuality comes in. Um, Jeff, did you want to add anything there? Yeah. Um, additionally, with this, we thought the gender unicorn was a, a very concrete way to explain some of these topics if you haven't been introduced to them before. Um, but additionally, it can be a more age appropriate way for a youth to help conceptualize this. So at this resource um, on the screen, um, there's also like a coloring page version of this. If you are working with a child who is having some of these questions and these identities and you want to help give them a framework to view some of these, this can be a resource to do so as well. Um, in fact, like you can use a coloring page, like for us, it would be inside of a therapy session when you're talking about some of these things with a client, if that's an age appropriate and culturally appropriate way to do so for you. Um, so additionally, we thought this would be a good way to highlight how you can maybe talk to youth about some of these concepts as well. Okay. And then, um, before we go over common identities, any questions with the gender unicorn? I would like to add to it if that's okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, I'll turn on my camera while I'm talking. So I uh, read child psychology recently and there are so many different, uh, from a biological sex uh, chromosome level, there's so many different variations. There's XX, there's XY, there's XXY, there's XYY. There's OX, there's XO, there's OY. So like uh, eggs can fail, eggs or sperm can fail to bring a sex chromosome. Uh, so there's, there are, so like, it's kind of interesting that our society is binary when like from the chromosome level, there, level there's this whole spectrum. And then also in addition to uh, like all that variations in sex chromosomes, you can also be XX and have a, what is it? excessive androgen or the male sex mm -hmm. or you can be xy and have androgen insensitivity so it was kind of eye-opening to see like 50 year old research that shows that it is literally a spectrum of gender like from a biological level it's this whole spectrum it's not xx or xy there's a there's a there's a whole slew and so that was really eye-opening for me to see that Thank you. That's that's really fascinating. I'd love to to be able to take a look at that resource sometime in the, in the future as well. If you have access to it, I'd love to. I, I actually to made in. I made a PDF and highlighted it, and I sent it to all my clients that they might care about it. Uh, yeah, message me, and I'll I'll send that email to anyone that PDF to anyone who wants to see it. It just summarizes it in six textbook pages. So. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, and I, I think that really does is like a great example of how even like biologically gender is not binary. Um, and we'll, we'll go over a history piece, too, that will help inform maybe how we got to such a binary society, um, which plays a piece in all of this that we're talking about. OK, so this next slide. Um, Hyrule, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? I'm happy to. Um, so 
we've we've kind of listed out our acronym, right? I told you we may interchange LGBTQ plus with queer. Um, this is where I wanted to kind of expand on, on that uh, statement a little bit further. Um, in the research that you've done, and and maybe even just kind of being introduced to this, you may have seen LGBT, LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus might have then evolved into LGBTQIA+, and even more recently I've seen it as LGBTQIA2S+. And oof, I'm out of breath there, okay? It, it keeps on growing and it's like, what, what am I supposed to do here? And I know there's a lot of uncertainty with that. We've even discussed this in our academic setting to try and figure out what is what is the correct way of doing this. Um, and, and to that point, what we've kind of concluded, and I think this is maybe for all of you to decide as well, but we've tried to just go for consistency. Um, there's not a necessarily correct way, but the idea behind this acronym is we want to be inclusive of people's identities. Now, if you don't know what this alphabet soup stuff means, that's, that's what this slide is here to try and help with. Um, but I, I do want to refer back to what Jet mentioned just a couple slides earlier, if you're uncertain about terminology and identities and you're like, I really don't know what I'm doing, best practice is to respect somebody's self-identity. And when they share with you, hey, I'm a, a gay man, then that's the, that's the way that you refer to them um, as necessary, okay? So just quickly going through these, L in the acronym stands for lesbian, G, gay, B, bisexual, T, transgender. Okay, those ones I think are, are quite commonly used and understood. If anyone has questions on those, please share in the chat and we'll, we're happy to explore those a bit further. Um, the Q stands for queer and questioning. Um, questioning is a, is a big part of this experience because the society we operate in is heteronormative, meaning that it is assumed until proven otherwise that everyone is straight and cisgender. Cisgender means that um, the sex that you were assigned at birth matches your gender identity and expression. So for me, I was, I am a cisgender man. I, I was born male and I present male and I view myself as a man. Right, so I'm cisgender, um, as opposed to being transgender, where the sex assigned at birth does not match your your gender identity and expression. Okay, so getting to the point where you have to say, do I fit into this heteronormative society? That is that questioning period. Who who am I? Essentially, is the question. So that's one level of the Q. The other level of the Q is queer. And as I mentioned earlier, I use them interchangeably. Um, queer is, is much more an umbrella term. It used to be a, a derogatory um, phrase for referring to people who were homosexual or gender diverse. Um, I remember in high school, we would, after the football game, we would go and place near the queer. And I had no idea what that was even alluding to. So it used to be very much uh, a derogatory way of referring to somebody who was part of this community. Now it's being reclaimed. People are saying, oh, I'm queer to just say I'm, I'm part of this community if that's how they would like to identify. Um, then we get into the IAA2S and the plus of the, of the acronym. Intersex goes back to where we were talking about how um, biological sex as presented in your DNA may not be XY and XX. It, it could be something beyond that. Um, asexual refers to um, somebody who does not experience sexual attraction um, and that, uh, thank you, JC, I, I saw your chat. We appreciate that. Um, so, and that exists on a spectrum as well. And then we'll, we'll cover two spirit a little bit more. And then plus there's a whole slew of them. Reminder, just kind of refer to um, what 
what your clients refer to themselves as. Um, and then we'll go over the next piece, which is just a brief history. And we'll do that really quickly so then we can get into the lifespan piece because I'm aware of the time. Um, I want to make sure we get to the developmental piece that everybody or a lot of people are interested in. Um, so I'll let Ty Tyrell take this first slide for the history. Yeah. So I'm going to just briefly mention that the, the current perceptions of homosexual and gay are very new, only about 100 to 150 years old. And that's the way that we're operating because that's what we're used to. But if we look at history, genders across culture and history, there are significant examples of um, non-binary representation, meaning not male, not female, but something other. Um, Two Spirits is that uh, representation from many indigenous tribes of North America, where these individuals who are two-spirited represent both masculine and feminine traits, okay? Um, there's also historical representation of homosexuality and gayness um, across history. You can, you can look at some of these examples we've included on your own a little bit later, but one thing that we want to mention is that kind of uh, starting in the the earliest millennia post common era um, is, or I guess, uh, let's see, before common era and common era. So, so starting in zero AD and with the advent of Christianity, the spread of Judaism and um, Islam, the three monotheistic religions, they prioritized um, sexual activity solely for the purpose of procreation. And with that, um, the sexual intercourse between two people of the same gender was no longer tolerated because it didn't serve that purpose. And so as we saw these three religions spread across the globe, we also started to see societies criminalizing and punishing um, this other um, because of moral reasons. Um, Jet, do you wanna go on to the, to the more modern history? Yeah, so for the more modern history, we're looking at a little bit of more American and a little bit more within uh, like the 1900s is the earliest we look. Um, and on the previous slide, if uh, towards the end, we saw the first example in 1650 of homosexuality and gay men being prosecuted alongside Jewish um, individuals. And so we see this again in the Holocaust in 1934, where gay people were identified with an upside down pink triangle and were also sent to concentration camps um, during this time. Um, in 1948, we see a paper published, Sexual Behavior and Behavior in the Human Male by um, Kinsey. Um, it is dated nowadays. Um, there's much more relevant research, but it is one of the first examples we see of research being done. And it has found that people are a little bit more gay than we thought they were. Um, uh, then moving on to like more recent, we know that the don't ask, don't tell law, that's um, another big one. We also see that on in 1987, on October 11th, um, there was a civil rights demonstration and it would later become known as Com National Coming Out Day. And this was one of the largest uh, civil demonstrations, civil rights demonstrations in US history. Um, and then if we go a little bit more to modern day, present day, we have seen several no laws nationwide um, being passed or attempted to being passed to restrict the rights of transgenders individual in access to care. Utah specifically, there was recently a bathroom um, bill where it limited who can use what bathrooms and put laws around that. Um, and it was targeted towards transgender individuals. Um, so that's a little bit more of the modern history. And this kind of is just to highlight, like how did we get to what the attitudes we have about homosexuality and gender today? Um, and this like zooms out and gives like a broader picture of like, okay, why do we think this way? And it's because we've thought this way because of these things for um, quite some time. So does anybody have any questions about the history piece they would like to talk about? Um, we're, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop up or put it in the chat, but for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and move on to the next piece of our presentation. Um, and so this is, we're going to look across about development, common experiences, protective 
factors and risk factors for mental health across the lifespan for this particular community. Um, so, Tyrell, do you want to take this one? I do. Um, the historical context, just to kind of show you about the way that our society operates, right? So, based on our current societal perceptions, we know that the, the queer community is a marginalized um, population. With that being said, this quote comes directly from the Trevor Project, which is a resource we've included for you all. Um, they say it should, it should be noted that LGBTQ plus youth are not inherently prone to suicide risk because of, their, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, but rather they are placed at higher risk because of how they are mistreated and stigmatized in society. Um, this is referring to some data that uh, the Trevor Project publishes that, that increased um, rates and risk of suicide um, among LGBT youth. Um, this is true with, with a lot of marginalized populations, but it's not because of their identity. It's because of how they're mistreated and stigmatized. So Jet, if you want to go to the next slide, um, what we want to explore is, okay, what, what does it look like it kind of significant stages of life and and what what can we do about it okay so we're kind of breaking this down a little bit we're not going to really dive into the risk and protective factors we've included those there for you to peruse what we want to highlight is more of the common experience of what it is like for a queer person at each stage of life okay so at, a, at about the age of two um between two and four this is where we see children starting to learn and observe enough um, within their families, within society, to be able to distinguish um, gender on a binary scale, okay? At about the age of two, children are aware of differences between boys and girls. Boys have short hair, girls have long hair. Boys wear sporty clothes, girls wear cute dresses and stuff, right? Whatever we as a society break down gender to be. And at about the age of three, most of these children can also look at themselves and say, oh, I'm a boy because I meet this criteria, or oh, I'm a girl because I meet this criteria. And then at the age of four, that, that is much more solidified, okay? Um, Jet, did you wanna add anything to, to kind of what I explored there? Um, yeah, with this piece, um, like looking back on for a lot of queer people, this is not a time of the life they're necessarily gonna have memories of um, themselves, but th th it's commonly that we've heard parents um, say, well, yeah, looking back, I knew at like four about my child. Like there's behaviors you are starting to see. With that being said, because you're seeing stereotypical behaviors of one thing, don't put pressure necessarily on your child as a label, be open and willing and accepting for whatever that child decides to um, bring forth. And this applies more so later on, right? Um, two to four, this is really, really young. We're not seeing a ton of LGBTQ plus stuff related this particular age. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we have a video on here that for sake of time, we're not going to show you. Um, I do believe this was a pretty popular video, though, so just kind of summarizing it. This is a video where, where you see um, children mimicking the behaviors of their parents. And it starts out kind of cute with them doing some cute activities, but then it even evolves into a child smoking a cigarette because the dad is smoking a cigarette right next to him. And then mom flipping somebody off as she's driving in the car and, and the kid in the back seat doing the same thing, right? So children observe what we do and repeat that behavior and in this age range between five to nine our school age years we are sponges that are seeking up and absorbing information knowledge norms labels we're just putting everything into context okay this includes values impressions um understanding societal norms, right? This is where people kind of really take root into what the correct way is to experience humanity. And that is taught, again, by family and society and their peers. 
Yeah. Um, additionally, I've worked some with this age range in a couple of different capacities. And it's really true that what they observe in their family and from their peers tend to be um, what is expressed. And so if there's negative views expressed about homosexuality, being transgender, those are this is the point in time where we start to see some of that become internalized um, for children. And so like in therapeutic experience, like with a lot of queer people I heard being like, no, I knew from a young age that my family didn't think this was okay. Therefore, I didn't think it's okay. I thought myself was not okay. Because if it's, if your family is telling you that something's not okay, that's an intrinsic part of yourself and your identity, um, it can start to internalize at this age. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anything so, else you would like? Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead and go to the next slide. I was kind of anticipating that. On the next slide, I've included a case study with a, a client that I'm specifically working with. We're not going to go over this. This is something for you to to review just for the sake of time. It, it's not the case study that you all will be exploring after the presentation. We wanted you to have some, some real examples though. We've, we've got four case studies total that are real clients that Jet and I are currently working with. Um, and and this, is, this is the work that we do, is trying to help people navigate um, coming out and, it, and trying to rectify the dissonance that may exist between their identity and what the perceived norms are. So these case studies, feel free to look over those in um, in the future once you have our slides, if, if that's of interest to you. Do you wanna to go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is um, adolescence preteen. I correct me if I'm wrong, Tyrell, with this one. In my experience and from the research, this is when you, we really start to see, um, especially closer to like puberty, some of this who am I attracted to romantically, who am I sexually attracted to? Puberty makes attraction and sexuality and hormones go wild. So this is like the first instance where I feel that we really start, if there is any conflict against the norm, start to see it being presented in. I'm an individual um, and expressed that way. Um, and yeah, so this is really truly the beginning of some of these things really heavily tied into puberty and the hormones that people are experiencing for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanna pause here for just a brief moment and do a check-in with everybody. Um, we, we discussed with Janelle that um, our let's see you guys need to jump into the case study approximately in about 10 minutes we can stop here which we know is only only a few years into the lifespan right um i want to be mindful of time so i want to to kind of get a collective feel if people would like us to continue to explore the lifespan we can do that if people want us to stop and and discuss questions and Janelle, maybe you can make an executive decision if, if nobody feels like they want to do that. I'd like you to continue. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to continue. I know that we're kind of rushing through this. I'm not the greatest. I, I tend to be verbose, which is something. So we'll continue the lifespan, but we will make sure that we... We end um, for 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 you all at the the appropriate time, okay. Um, um, is there anything you wanted to add here, Tyrell, to the slide? Trying to get, trying to get back to that. <laughs> I switched over to speaker view. Let's see. Um, with this one, the only thing that I want to highlight is kind of moving forward. You are going to see some differentiation in the risk and protective factors. Um, the way that we've split these out is that the risk factors and protective factors that are kind of in that first bulleted point, those are common across human experience, right? Queer people are people. And so a lot of these risk and protective factors that you're seeing, it, it's not exclusive to queer identity, right? Now, where we started to break these out, these bolded bullet points, these are things that are specifically um, either risk or protective factors as they pertain to the queer experience. This experience of being like, oh, shoot, my intrinsic identity is not acceptable. I 
I am other, I am not okay. And there's that confusion and questioning. Why am I not the norm? So for example, isolation and rejection, those are significant risk factors that will lead to increased uh, mental, uh, mental uh, distress and, and health concerns. Ways to combat that is by providing sources of community, acceptance and authenticity in their social environments, um, providing age and culturally appropriate sex education so that people are not confused about what's going on. Now, we, we've also included in the risk and protective factors, religion and social media. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, and maybe it's changed, but I, I believe the case study may lean into social media a bit. Social media can be incredibly powerful for creating community, and it can be incredibly powerful at isolating and bullying. Um, and so we'll kind of leave it at that. Um, but I did want to highlight kind of how the risk and protective factors have been differentiated as we continue on through the presentation. Um, I will add just additionally another piece in there with social media, such as like TikTok or Instagram. It also provides a point of representation for that individual. If they are in a society where they do not see um, non-heterosexual relationships, um, this might also be a time where they get to expose to some of those things, and that can also help create community and representation. Um, representation in media is a protective factor for any individual in their identity. This can include things outside of sexuality, including race, religion, ethnicity, all of that. Um, so that's another piece with the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, Ready to move to the next. Yep, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> As we kind of uh, start, oh, wait, I forgot about this one. Um, here's an infographic for you. We're not going to go through percentages, but these, the, the one thing I want to highlight here is that um, this study compares risk factors and um, like common risky behaviors um, uh, between like LGBTQ identities and their heterosexual peers, okay? And you're going to notice that across the board, queer people are much more at risk, okay? And it goes back to that quote that we highlighted. It's not because they inherently and in, in their identity have some sort of problem it's because they're experiencing this marginalization and, and this ostracizing effect from, from their society. Um, and then we included a link to that survey. There's a lot more there. It was done by the CDC, um, and you can go look more in depth about some of this information too. So this is adolescents or teens, and I think this is probably where um, both Tyrell and I have a little bit more experience in our like work with this um, population, um, this age range and young adult. Um, and so Tyrell, I'll let you take this one away. This one feels like a, a good one for you to talk about. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the whole reason that I ended up entering the field of social work is because I, I was a high school teacher and lost a few students to suicide. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted to do something about this. Um, and so th this is this is my area of expertise is working with ado adolescents in their in their teen years. Um, during the teen years, this is where we end up seeing differentiation from parents and family. I'm trying to form the self, right? Who am I? And and that is constantly informed by their experiences within the society. Um, between the relationships that they prioritize. Um, there's this constant dance between I'm independent while also being a dependent child, right? And, and we know that healthy um, patterns during this stage for, for teenagers is to kind of slowly give a release of responsibility to the child. Now, for, for those who are queer, um, if they have a lack of information, a lack of representation, if they feel unsafe in being able to establish that identity, this is where we're going to see internalized hatred, shame, 
and guilt, um, that lack of acceptance, even if it's just coming from themselves, um, drives a lot of um, essentially distress for, for the psyche. Um, ways that we can try and protect teens in this area is by providing that space for validation and authenticity. Being able to have a gay straight alliance in a high school reduces the risk of, of suicide within that school significantly. Um, I'll have to find the specific studies that we've pulled for this. Um, this, this area is also where teens trying to solidify who they are are potentially more likely to come out. Coming out is the process of, because we live in a heteronormative society, essentially being like, guys, I have to inform you that I am not the normal. And that usually will take place in, in different stages. Usually you have to come out to yourself first and acknowledge and embrace that I am not the heteronorm. I am not the the norm gender, the the uh, sex that was assigned at birth. You have to come out to yourself first, which then follows usually sharing with folks in safe spaces, areas where you feel that you will receive that validation and acceptance. Um, typically then you'll come out to those who are the closest to you, whether or not you feel safe or not. It, there's there's like a sense of obligation that that queer folk feel to be able to inform those who, who know them best. Um, and coming out is never a, a single process. It, it's continuous throughout one's life. Um, now, just because there are common stages, it's important to note that there is not a single correct way for somebody to come out it's as individual as, as the person themselves. Um, Jet, what would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, and I don't know if we highlighted this at the beginning, but it relates to what Tyrell just said is like we have broken this down over common experiences. Um, this does not necessarily mean that someone won't come out later in life or realizes about themselves. We even have a case study about a later in life example of this. So this is just a very general this is kind of what to expect in the process, but it is going to be different individual to individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could potentially be earlier. And there's no rule that says somebody can't come out before the age of 14. Um, but yeah. yeah, what we as providers can do is regardless of where we're at um, in our personal values or personal beliefs, um, what we as service providers can do is allow space for these individuals to feel authentic, um, to non-judgmentally accept them, to be, honor their pronouns, honor their experience, um, educate ourselves, um, and treat them with respect and dignity that is owed to everyone. Um, there, there's no in, in my personal opinion, this is my soapbox. Uh, in my in my personal opinion, just because one is religious or political or confused or uninformed, whatever it may be, uh, I'm not trying to say those all align with each other. That could come across very poorly. But the the number one protective factor for folks is acceptance and safety. And that is something that we can provide easily um, if we allow them to exist. I'm going to stop with the soapbox there. <laughs> Jet, do you want to continue on or add anything? <laughs> um, I don't have anything to add here. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> um, <laughs> are we good to move on to the next slide? Yeah, and just for time's sake, we we do only have about two minutes, so we. May want to wrap up. Yeah, we'll we'll go ahead. Do you care if I just speed run the next few slides? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. We have another case study here. Um, 
uh, of one of a client that we work with um, for the teen range, age range. Next over here, we have the young adult. Um, this one I just really wanted to highlight that coming out is a continual process that um, there's not just like you come out, make a Instagram post and you're done. You usually have to continually inform people, especially in the work setting and other professional settings. So as a professional to a professional, um, if you're able to, making yourself known as an ally to the community, whether that be through actually saying that or through like a little rainbow flag sticker somewhere um, can indicate to a, a coworker that you are a safe space for them. Um, and this is also the time where we can also see some conflict. Maybe not everybody is, they have come out to themselves, but maybe not the world. Once again, it kind of goes back to the stages referred to. Um, this can be a continual process, especially if there's not been examples given to them. Um, and then we have a case study for a young adult. Um, and then the next piece, we have adulthood. Um, this is when marriage starts to become a little bit more of a common experience. Um, children, and how are you going to manage if you're in a heterosexual relationship? How are you going to inform your children about the LGBTQ plus community? If you're in a non-heterosexual relationship, what does that look like for you and your family? Um, and then we have late adulthood. We also wanted to point out here that there's not a lot of older gay people due to the many um, health risks that we pointed out. Suicide being a number, a really big one up there. Um, Additionally, we have to look at the culture and attitude of the people who are in this age range. What did they grow up around? We wanted to point out that the AIDS epidemic really influenced this particular um, age range of queer individuals um, with recognizing that it did influence all queer individuals to some degree. This is a very common story, um, experience brought up, um, but in this age range particularly, you're not going to see a lot of older folk who are queer maybe as you do younger people and that's just because they, due to circumstances and the environment and many other things, they did not live to be this age. Um, then we have the case study that I mentioned earlier about the older individual um, who is coming out at about 71 years old, which is an atypical experience, but does happen. And then um, continuing discussion, we wanted to talk about intersectionality of this. LGBTQ plus is one piece of a person's identity. This intersects with things like religious beliefs and values, race, disability. Um, uh, we wanted to point out a little bit that there's allied communities, a disability community we have regularly seen as an allied community to the queer community um, with a promotion of a lot of the same values of just accepting and making it a welcome and opening space for those uh, experiencing life different, differently than the stereotypical normal person. Um, and then this is also when we can talk about pathologizing normative experiences um, in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is what Tyrell and, use, and I um, have to use in our practice. Um, we There's a history involved with that where normative experiences were previously pathologized. Homosexuality was in the DSM for years and it no longer is. Um, so just keeping in mind as healthcare providers, we can unintentionally pathologize something that is a very normal experience for this community. And then I will just go very quickly and highlight the resources that we provided for you um, and point out that we have a lot of resources. So if there's something on here that you feel that you're missing and don't have, reach out to Tyrell or I and we can provide resources for that. So these are for your clients. These are very uh, client-centered and resources for queer individuals or their family themselves. Flourish therapies on here. I really support Flourish Therapy. I know I don't personally work there and Tyrell does, but I really do value them in their work, as well as looking at local community resources, such as local pride centers are another great, great way to build acceptance and community. Um, and then we have resources for practitioners. So a lot of these are a little bit more informed at the healthcare level and um, will be more resources geared to you helping your understanding of some of these things. I try to include a lot of um, youth oriented resources given the context of this um, presentation and there's all of those. You can look at those on your own time. Uh, and then questions. <laughs> Did I miss it? I don't know if we even have time for quick. questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of that great information. I think that for a lot, um, maybe many of us on this call, it was a great introduction to it. And hopefully I can reach back out to you guys in the upcoming years um, so that we can explore this more. Cause I think, I mean, I know that a lot of questions came up for me that I would love to have some more 
um, information on, especially as we're supporting the young families that may be um, going through some of these concerns and questions. So I thank yeah. you. In the both. presentation, we have uh, a very last slide. It's, it's our contact information if folks do want to reach out with additional questions. And we would love to come back and expand on this. This was that introduction across the lifespan. And there's so many more nuances that we could cover. Yeah. That's great. Well, I thank you. I am going to ask um, Rebecca if she will come on and share her case, and then we'll go from there. And thank you both Tyrell and Jet for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry, guys. Go ahead. Um, I was actually wondering if um, yeah. someone had access to my slides from um, the Institute on Disability instead of me. I don't have access currently, but I can paraphrase where needed. So case presentation wise, I'm just limited resources that I apologize for that. But I appreciate the um, case studies that Tyrell and Jet got. Um, I feel like they're pretty pertinent. Because, um, I mean, the big thing about this topic as well is that there's so many different case studies you can go into, right? Um, and I was interested also with the question be like, so what is the intersectionality with disability and the queer community? Um, and that's a little bit more where I'm at, but we're just going to focus on um, the queer community and a bit of that social media aspect. So looking at um, a individual, I'm going to call her Ella, and she is in the um, Hispanic Latina uh, community. Um, her family is uh, born this, uh, in the U.S. I think it was like their grandparents that were from like Mexico. And um, she's 22. She has, I think, been going to therapy for the past year. This is a clinical setting. And um, with Ella, she is um, currently dating someone uh, that is a girlfriend. And she was wanting to talk to her family and um, have that kind of coming out conversation about being bisexual. Um, this family is, um, for religious aspects, Catholic, um, not really practicing them. And um, so in the past week or so uh, for this situation, Ella has um, talked to her family, has said, um, I'm bisexual, and the conversation didn't go well. Uh, the family didn't feel very supportive in the sense that um, just the way that um, I guess Ella is working with therapy and having a girlfriend and then uh, family and um, I guess that dissonance between um, I guess values at the moment. And so the family came to say that, I mean, Ella's currently living with them um, and um, they had come out to say that you can't participate in the queer community if you're part of this household, kind of like my house, my rules sort of thing. Um, and so the case presentation is mostly about coming into that clinical setting, knowing that background, it's been pretty fresh, uh, having that conversation with family and trying to figure out next steps. So this can look like, I mean, the role of social media, this can look like um, next steps in the clinical setting if there's other resources or um, further information or questions you would ask Ella to get a better handle on how best to help her in her situation. So I guess I should um, ask for the next part if there's any um, clarifying questions to ask uh, before like breakout rooms. And so Rebecca, one of the things we're gonna do today is just stay in this large breakout group. So um, we can just go through that. And if anybody um, has any clarifying questions or um, any recommendations, Shane is gonna be our note taker for this. So I'll break the questions down then. So yeah, the first question being clarifying questions, anything more you need to know about the family um, or the therapist or Ella. Um, I had a different thought, so that's okay. So oh, JC gonna, has a yeah. question. Yeah, Rebecca, Perfect. could you say a little bit more about, and I might've missed this, but just more about the initial reasons for seeking therapy and working with the therapist, if that had anything to do with gender sexuality or if it was like coming in with depression and anxiety and then as part of that process 
they teased out that this was a piece for her. Could you do you have any more information about that piece? Yes, that's the latter part. Sorry, that was also the tidbit. Um, it's a it's also an interesting situation because it's um, a warning sign, I should say, when they're feeling like depressed and discouraged, which is how she felt after the conversation with family um, for suicidality. And so one of those warning signs, uh, she did come in for anxiety and depression. Yes. So one of the questions, oh, Jeff. My one question I have is what's like the importance of family for this individual being with a Catholic background and a non-white background? Um, is family like super important for her? And is that part of the reason for as much distress being brought up? Yes, yes. Um, the reason why she wanted to even have that conversation with her family was that family is important. She wanted um, them to be part of that uh, relationship with a girlfriend and just kind of just not even be transparent, but have more of that um, relationship, family-based value. Okay, so um, what was the question? I'm trying to think, I'm so sorry. So next question, you'd be looking at um, immediate needs, things you would try and um, address in that session with Ella, trying to talk through, I guess, looking at goals or looking at um, what you're hoping to accomplish by the end of that session. So one of the big things that um, Rebecca brought to the group was saying, what is the professional would you share with this particular individual as a resource. Does anybody have any ideas on that? Jeff, JC. Oh, JC, I'm never okay. going to get that. Um, Janelle knows me as Jeff, which is fine as well. I go by both like Jet and Jaylee. Um, I just don't have it on the screen. So uh, yeah, I think this is a, an opportunity to connect with other people that have had similar experiences of the age group. So I think this is where um, the local pride centers can come in. The local community groups that are peer-based um, could be really helpful. So as a, as a practitioner, I would want to be familiar with some of those resources and, and point them towards here's a peer group that's, you know, not necessarily a therapeutic setting, but it's a way to get with other people that have maybe navigated um, these experiences themselves. And like the peer support, like we know from disability is also such a big piece. So I would go for peer support networks um, pretty, pretty early on in the conversation, in my opinion. So my thought was also, I love that um, JC on the peer support. I think that's really helpful. I'm also was wondering if her parents had been included in maybe some of that therapy and if they are going through some of their own um, issues as this is coming out. I mean, as a parent, we do tend to uh, have certain expectations of our kids and, you know, sometimes that may, we have our own issues um, to deal with uh, just as would wonder if that's a possibility or something that has been recommended. For sure. And yeah, exploring parental expectations, just their own kind of mental health and seeing things like that in maybe family therapy or just in um, maybe follow-up conversations or trying to figure it out. It's cool. Um, I did pause a social media component to this. So I'm curious what you guys, um, what your thoughts are looking at the role of social media. Could it be helpful? Could it be harmful in the situation? Are there specific resources like pages or groups um, that might be worthwhile for Ella? Or if it should be a, hey, make sure that as you're going through this, um, you might be avoiding social media more or what your thoughts are on it. What are anybody's thoughts on social media? That it can both help and harm simultaneously. <laughs> Good point, Samuel. That's just so true. So I'm going to tease that out a little bit then, um, Samuel. Uh, with that, what sort of things could be helpful? What sort of things could be harmful? How could you have that discussion with Ella? I think it's helpful when it's like normalizing, helping them feel connected, helping them make social connections. 
and I think it's harmful. I don't know if communities go into kind of the culty us versus them or like turns to like, I don't know, victimy or villainizing the other side excessively. Uh, yeah, like, and, and you got to look at it. Is it serving the client or not? Uh, and, and I don't know, I guess you just kind of uh, would enforce maybe, I don't know, I don't know if this is a real term, like social media competence, basically like how one can like determine like, is this piece serving me or is this piece harming me? Can I a la carte it? Can I take the parts that are beneficial and leave behind the parts that are not beneficial? Kind of that mindset. Yeah. So then we talked a little bit to like the things pertinent to the actual conversation Ella had with her family altogether. Are there other aspects to this vignette that um, we should be focusing on that we can Heather. find maybe resources for? Heather has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Heather. You're okay. perfectly fine, Rebecca. Um, I was just going to share um, you know, kind of a real life social media um, aspect to that. So both both sides of that harmful and helpful um so my own teen um has a, a severe disability and um social media has been really beneficial in one aspect because her disability is not um it's it's not a common experience for a, a lot of individuals and so on the one hand um it was normalizing for her um it gave her a sense of community and it gave her a sense of this isn't something that is 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 so isolating it happens to other people there was a, an ability to relate to other people and there was an, a sense of um being able to feel like this was something that she could get through and that she could go from day to day and and that gave her an ability i think to feel like um, she could have a sense of humor about it because she saw other people do that, right? So there was some positivity there. And I think there were a lot of things that she could gain from that experience. However, um, the flip side of that was that her particular disability happens to be a disability that can be triggered <laughs> um, by other people with the same disability. So um, too much of exposure to that makes her disability worse. So it's kind of a thing where if, you know, it, it does create a sense of community, it does provide a positive aspect for her because it is a disability that can be isolating and there's not a lot of people with it. But at the same time, that social media aspect has also created a real dis difficulty for a lot of people like her because all of a sudden this community, they're also creating kind of their own self-harming aspect because they are so desirous to have this connection that sometimes they're going over the top and it creates more harm than good because there's too much exposure. And so um, there's sometimes their own the worst enemy because they have to really turn on the self-regulation, right? And, and for their age, in that teenage age range, that's a really difficult thing to do when you're trying to develop your self-identity, when you're trying to feel connected, when you're trying to feel like you're not the only person who's dealing with, you know, this crisis in your life and nobody gets it. Um, yeah. So there's definitely some positives. There's definitely some negatives, but I think it also requires an additional support network to really help you to negotiate that support piece in a healthy way too. Yeah, great. Jet, you have your hand raised. Yeah, something that got brought up that we didn't get to cover in the presentation that this it seems to apply to this situation is a conversation about family of origin versus family of choice. That's a very um, unfortunately common experience in the queer community is that you'll need to set for safety even, um, in some cases, emotional and physical boundaries with the family of origin and really emphasizing that you can choose to have supportive people in your life who support that piece of your identity. And that can be done through social media. 
especially for those living in rural areas. There's not a lot of opportunity to connect to other queer individuals. Um, just if we look at population, queer individuals tend to be in larger cities, so that's where it's more socially acceptable. So social media can play a role into help developing a family of choice here and giving support where they may not get it at home. That's a pretty good point in any situation, um, as specifically what you're talking about in the queer community, the family of choice. And so, I mean, family of choice, support group, just emotional, um, what is it I would say with that? I'm so sorry. It's this idea of you have friends you can fall back on um, for emotional support in a way that they are there for that kind of role. Whereas, you know, some people are good for that. Other people are not really emotionally available. Kind of just understanding where people are at that you are around. So maybe in the situation um, with the family, like you have even individual members, you can't just generalize. Everyone's totally um, uh, on the same page as the parents that were saying, um, not welcome here in the house if you're gonna be participating in this community sort of thing. So kind of parsing that as well and looking at who's safe for what conversations and who can I talk to about different things to get that support. Okay. Um, were there any other hands raised? JC. Real quick on the family piece, and I, I just know a little bit about this from the work they do at Flourish. Um, working with families in this set, back to what you were saying, Janelle, there, there's a continuum too of like, um, that can go from like, not acceptance, acceptance to celebration, right? And we see this, again, this is analogous to the disability, right? So there's there's disability pride movement now that comes out of gay pride movement. And so, and there's a, a whole this continuum in between and family might be any place that's like complete non-acceptance to uh, families that just celebrate this human being for who they are and how they identify. And then in between that is all of this other squishy stuff. Um, and, and that plays into all of the contextual factors for the family, which is the cultural piece and the religious piece and, and all of that. So this, the coming out process is kind of there's an analogous thing I think for the family of the acceptance process. It's it's not a here okay now we accept. It's it's just continuing like well what does this mean and what does this mean for grandbabies and what does this I mean all of these things that families have. So it's just to, to be aware that they're also going through a very fluid process and important points of support are key to the family as well. And the idea is we try to help families move. Um, if they're in non-acceptance, at least closer to acceptance. There are families that will never get to celebration and that's just part of the human experience. But can we get to that validation acceptance piece where there's emotional and physical safety that are those protective factors for these um, young folks? So I think that's an important piece that I really appreciate that groups like Flourish really do work with families on that specific piece because that is definitely part of this complex uh, situation. Yeah, that's a great piece and point of it. Anybody else have any recommendations or things to share with Rebecca? Samuel. Yeah, so this was more answering like the first question than the second one, but I had some thoughts there. Uh, you know, like I agree with what Sheen said, like the family needs to be intervened with. One of the complicating parts is like, yeah, like assessing, like, can this family be intervened with? If so, like, to what extent? If by attempting to intervene, am I going to make the situation worse? And so it's hard because, yeah, you got to pick the client's brain to find out, like, how likely the parents are to be intervened with, taking into account the client's bias in the situation. And then if you do intervene with the, the parents, you know, uh, that's going to be a tricky situation because, they need to be intervened with, but they also, they need to feel validated. They, we need empathy for them too. You know, their cultural upbringing and values and thinking patterns, there's like history behind it and it, it makes sense to them. And so like how to intervene with them is gonna be challenging at that point because yeah, you have to have that relationship with them. Uh, you know, I wonder if the family needs, if the parents need mental health support in general and so this interaction has to go really well so they don't leave with the overgeneralization like therapy bad like that's where you go and they tell you bad things about you sounds good those are great things thank you well we are just about close to wrapping up so anybody have any last thoughts 
or feedback for Rebecca? JC. I'm talking a lot. I have to give a shout out to Tyrell, Jet, and Rebecca, who all are my current students in their final, they're going to graduate in five weeks and be out doing this full time. And they're tremendous um, advocates and professionals. So I appreciate them. I know, you know, stepping in kind of a, at a last minute piece for, for the project. So I just want to like shout out to them for doing this uh, on fairly short notice and also just in the middle of their studies. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great thing. And like I said, I think it's a, a piece that sometimes we uh, don't always think about or we, uh, so it was really interesting to me to hear from that younger end of things and um, uh, it was just great. So thank you. We are next um, month talking about a, a pretty sensitive topic and it is about suicide. So we will be having a social worker come and talk to us about that. So please, um, Join us for that and take the survey and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.